Oh, oops, I forgot to unlock my laptop. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. So, um, um, welcome to the end of Container Camp. I hope you enjoyed it. So, I'll be talking about, well, what is in the slide? Securing container runtimes, you know, how hard can it be? You know, it's a, it's a solved problem. They've been around for a while. Surely there are no other issues that could possibly pop up, um, you know, ever again. We're all done with this. Let's move on. Uh, so this talk actually came about um, after about a year or so of discussion with other folks from other container runtimes, uh, as well as some kernel engineers. And it turns out there actually are still a couple of sticky problems uh, with container runtimes, uh, particularly with securing the very low-level parts of the stack. So um, I'm going to try to give a bit of an overview as well as a couple of like detailed examples of sorts of problems that we have uh, and some proposed solutions that I hope will um, help improve things. Uh, so yeah, so let's get started. So quickly, who am I? Uh, Alexa, senior software engineer at SUSE. Uh, I maintain run C, which is the runtime that powers Docker and Containerd. Uh, I also maintain some of the specifications around containers. OCI was mentioned a couple of times. I'm one of the maintainers of that. Um, and I also do some kernel work here and there, depending. Uh, and yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm really hoping uh, that nobody submits a CV as soon as I finish my talk. Um, I'd like to go home and rest. So uh, if you would mind, please wait until Monday before submitting security bugs. Uh, that'd be great, thanks. So let's get started. So what what do, I mean, what do I mean when I say securing container runtimes? Because obviously, security is a bit of a you know, nebulous topic. Uh, you can include basically anything. You can include um, you know, um, a meltdown inspector in security if you would like. Um, but what, what are we talking about today? So we're not going to talk about container attacks that are actually just kernel zero days. Um, because, well, kernel zero days are interesting. Um, and it's really neat to learn about them. But ultimately, they're not a container runtime problem. They're a kernel problem. Um, and you're dealing with a security bug that affects everyone. Um, and as an aside, usually containers actually protect against many kernel zero, kernel zero days because we have um, default seccom profiles for both Docker and LXC and even like Rocket and some other runtimes. We block ancient syscalls that usually have bugs in them. Um, so you actually are more secure in that aspect. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, and obviously, there are some obvious security goofs like zero auth uh, RCEs um, that has happened. It's not a joke. These two CVs are actually for Docker from 2014. Um, yes, you could root a box just if it had Docker installed. Um, so what are we talking about? So the focus of basically anything else. Anything else is fair game. Um, in particular, I'll be focusing today on bugs that are involving uh, interactions between uh, runtimes and malicious container code because container runtimes, we'll get into a minute what they actually do. There's a lot of very intrusive work that we have to do as a container runtime to actually get the damn thing to run. And as a result, there are many, 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 many opportunities for problems. And usually, most security vulnerabilities we see are related to a container runtime trying to do some sort of operation, and the container is messing around with either its own state or the file system or other things, and you end up with, oops, I have root on your box. Um, and the one thing I want to say, and this is I want you to repeat after me, OK? Repeat after me. I will use user namespaces. OK, why will you use user namespaces? So uh, there's a lot of people who have mixed views on user namespaces. They think that maybe, well, I have AppArm, or I have SecComp, I have SC Linux. We're all good, right? No, you're not. Uh, S, uh, user namespaces are a security primitive in Linux that has existed for uh, more than five years now. And it allows for isolation of users. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, user namespaces in detail today. I just want to point out that, I mean, if you start falling asleep in the middle of the talk, I wanted to get this up front. Um, if you don't have user namespaces enabled now, I won't blame you for it. That's fine. The reason why most people don't is because Docker doesn't have them on by default. And because it's not the default, people don't look into it. But um, it is the case, for instance, and I'll give you an example. There was a couple of security bugs we found in container runtimes maybe two years ago. Uh, and what I was shocked to discover is that, um, well, the fix that we had for them was, oh, we'll add this particular security check based on user namespaces. But when I told the kernel devs that were working on this, because we were collaborating at the time, that, well, sure, you can add the check for user namespaces, but you do know that like 90% of people don't use user namespaces, right? And the response was, well, they're running insecure systems and we can't fix that. So in other words, if you don't use user namespaces, you are like actively turning off security for your clusters, for your containers. Please use user namespaces. I'm begging you, please. Uh, the vast majority of CVs that I'm going to talk about would have been blocked if people use user namespaces. Yes, they also happen to have been blocked with SE Linux. But um, actually, I'm not going to talk about SE Linux. That would be, um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit too rude to talk about it. But effectively, uh, user namespaces would have solved this problem for 
result the majority of these CVEs and the ones that it didn't solve, I'm gonna talk about today. So, uh, let's start with, um, so, a, you know, a small fire. Um, because contain, so, you've probably heard this before many, many times, I won't rehash it. Uh, containers don't exist on Linux. They, they don't exist as a, as a real concept. Containers are this mix of different, of different parts, of different kernel APIs. And the key point is that that means that user space, that well, the, the, the royal me as well as other maintainers that work on this stuff, we're in charge of actually setting this thing up to be secure. And because it's a whole hodgepodge of different features and different things that we combine together, you know, bad configuration, a simple, small a mistake uh, that we make can cause pretty catastrophic problems. Um, so all of these CVs are related to broken configuration. There are a couple of examples. Um, you know, one example is um, there was a, a vulnerability with capabilities. So capabilities are a Linux kernel feature where rather than having UID zero root have full control of everything, you, they've broken down the, the privileges into capabilities. The bug was that, uh, there were actually two bugs on this slide related to it. Um, that the bug was basically that we wouldn't drop all the capabilities properly. And that's just a configuration problem, it's our mistake, but it was the case that you would, you know, you run a container and you say drop all capabilities and it would still have the capability to, in the case of Docker in 2014, uh, you could actually just like open slash on the host using a particular capability that wasn't disabled. Now the way you solve this actually is again, you use user namespaces, and I wanna hear it again. I will use user namespaces. <laughs> no? Okay, fine. Um, well, you should. Uh, basically, the, the, the capabilities are also scoped by user namespaces. So all these capability problems would have been fixed. There are many, many examples, and I'll go, keep coming back to it, so please use user namespaces. Um, and there are a couple of examples of, of sort of fun bugs where we, uh, for instance, forgot to mask certain paths in ProcFS, which would allow you to overwrite things on the host. It was pretty nasty. Um, we hope they're all fixed. Um, well, yeah, well, we hope. Okay, so um, administrative operations. So that's sort of the basic stuff, where you have a configuration problem, so, oh, uh, something allows you to get out, okay, fine, we'll try to avoid these. Then we're starting to get a little bit more of the complicated problems. So um, effectively, con because, contain again, because containers aren't a thing, um, container runtimes, a lot of the operations we do uh, are in many, many different stages, and they're in atomic. So in, effectively, you have this process that you're creating, and in this example, these two CVs are related to um, uh, like Docker exec or, uh, or kubectl exec, whichever, whichever you like, um, where effectively the bug was that um, because we have this sort of uh, mismatch of different features we're trying to put together, uh, while we're setting up this process to join the container, there is a race condition where a process inside the container can then try to attack the process that's joining. So the one in 2016 was, was, a, was, a, uh, was one I found actually, which was effectively when you're joining, um, we had a file descriptor open, doesn't really matter. The idea is basically that we add a handle to the root file system of the host while joining, and the container process could just open it and go straight to the host file system and wreak havoc. Uh, the other one was a fun one that we released earlier this year, um, which definitely caused me to lose some sleep. Um, effectively, it would allow you to replace the uh, run C binary on the host file system, which obviously gets run as root with Docker. Um, you may have seen some cloud vendors uh, scrambling to fix this. That's what the bug was. Um, I'm glad it's fixed. Unfortunately, there are probably more problems like it, um, as I'll get into in a second. Um, but I would say the biggest problem um, is the file system, is file system problems. And as you'll see, there's plenty of CVs on the screen. Um, effectively, the biggest problem, I would argue, with a lot of, uh, well, sort of fundamental problem with getting container runtimes to be secure is that uh, effectively, uh, for sure, you have containers, and they're all in their own little boxes. But fundamentally, as, as you heard earlier today, uh, it's the same kernel. But more importantly, in the case of the file system, there's one file system like VFS layer in Linux that everything goes through. You know, and everything is a file. Sounds like a great idea until you find out that the whole thing is gonna catch fire. Um, and effectively, the problem here is, is that um, the kernel doesn't, doesn't fundamentally know that uh, when I'm joining another, this other container, that all these files that I have access to while I'm joining, they shouldn't ever have access to. And so if you have a single bridge, you can now hop into the host file system, and the kernel doesn't know that this file system is meant to be a separate thing. It shouldn't have access to it. Um, and the biggest problem actually is, is, is slash proc. It's sort of the biggest uh, contributor to this. Um, slash proc, if, if you use Linux, I presume, most of you do. Uh, if you go inside slash proc, you'll find all sorts of weird crap. Like it's, it's full of things that God knows why they exist, but they are useful features. Unfortunately, the vast majority, and in fact, I'm pretty sure 
maybe all or all minus one of these bugs were because proc gave access to certain things. So we have this sort of, you know, pretty, pretty big fire uh, going on inside the file system that we, that we need to fix. Um, so, uh, and then obviously, the, just generally the kernel interfaces. So uh, a lot of these interfaces that, create, that are used to create containers are, well, Janky is not the nice way of putting it, um, but they're pretty janky. But basically, they, they have all these different bits that have been added over time to try to cover certain holes. If you were to compare the history of Linux containers and how they were developed versus the history of how, for instance, zones on Solaris or jails on FreeBSD were developed, um, they were developed sort of backwards. Rather than saying, like, we start with a very limited set of capabilities and then we add to them instead on Linux, what's been happening is that we've been adding namespaces for things as we discover, oh, we really should protect that properly, oh, we should really do that. And so as a result, a lot of these interfaces are not, they weren't sort of thought of in one go, and uh, from a container runtime perspective, there's all sorts of complicated stuff you have to deal with. Um, and trying to get it. Um, I was gonna say, I just wanna point out, just, just as a joke, uh, do you know how hard it is to find a photo of a burning filing cabinet online? I, I'm not kidding, I spent like two hours yesterday trying to find it. So if you can find one before the end of the night, I will, uh, I'll buy you a beer, all right? Because I, I, there is none, okay. Uh, all right, <laughs> back to the talk. Uh, so I'll give you a trivial example of the sort of bugs that we have and a solution that we came up with for it. So this, this is a particular problem that existed maybe two years ago, maybe three years ago, which was that, um, Effectively, how do you create a console for a container? Now, if you imagine you run, you know, you do docker run dash it, you do kubectl exec it or whatever the, the flag is, you're creating a, a, a console for this, for this program. Now, consoles are a very interesting concept from the 1970s that still exist on computers today, even though we don't have teletype terminals. Let's not get into it. That's a bit of a, a different a side topic. Basically, the problem is, is that uh, you need to create, whenever, whenever you open a shell on a laptop or if you open, or if you get a container, um, the input and output from the main process has to go somewhere. And the way you do this is you create what's called a console. And the console, again, because of 1970s terminology, whoops, it has, uh, it has certain control of how processes work and so on and so on. But it's important that you create a console because, and there is uh, a security vulnerability in LXC and I think also in Docker, where if you don't create a console, uh, the container process can write bytes to the host terminal, as in like in your shell. So you run a container, you, you give it the, uh, the console of the host, and now it can write characters to the host, doing, for instance, I don't know, rm-rf or something like that. So the, way, so the way you get around this is you create a console. Unfortunately, even the interfaces for creating a console were, again, born of maybe the 1980s, I'm not actually sure. Um, this is what it looks like. So if to create a console, this is how you used to do it. We've, we've since fixed this problem, but basically the idea is, is that you open devptmx. This gives you the master end of a console, which is what your shell has open or whatever. And then you, you, get, you do an ioctal, which is a syscall to get like magical stuff from the kernel, and you get the number, like the pt number, and then you open dev PTS the number, right? And I mean, this, like the, this code is literally in glibc. Like there is code that looks like, this. well, it's a bit more complicated, but it looks like this, right? It's effectively like, oh, we get the number, then we open a file with that name. I mean, what happens if that, if that file is, I don't know, a symlink to something, or it's, I don't know, dev is not actually dev, but someone's been messing around with it, um, and you now, instead it's like some other file system, and you're being tricked into opening a file, and so on and so on. So, even just this very trivial example of I want to create a console, what is the correct way of doing it? You call two functions in glibc and now you have the opportunity to be tricked into opening a file you shouldn't open as a container runtime. So the way we fixed this was that we added a new feature to Linux, uh, again, this was a year or two ago, which basically would let you just say, screw all this number stuff, like why do we even care what the number is? I just want the thing. Effectively, we just get, we just get the, the FD. And this interface, I mean, this interface has existed for a very, very long time, and it was only now that we realized, oh, wait a second, <laughs> maybe we should fix that. So these are the sorts of problems that, that we hit with container runtimes, and obviously there's kernel work necessary to get this feature, but also uh, from user space side, we have to now modify a lot of things to use it. Nowadays, glibc uses this feature if it's available. Uh, most container runtimes use this feature now. So we fixed this particular problem. Um, so, what are the solutions to this, to this overall problem? Um, I'm afraid that I can't give you all of the solutions. It's still like an open question. I haven't even elaborated most of the problems that we might have. Um, if you buy me a drink later, I might. Um, uh, very, very uh, crassly. So, the, uh, I'm gonna give you some of the solutions, or at least a, solu a couple of solutions that we're working on that hopefully will fix some of these problems. Um, so, as I mentioned, the file system was sort of the, the big, um, you know, 
I'll be honest, if you're looking to try to find security vulnerabilities, that's where I would look. Um, I, I, again, please wait until Monday. Um, but effectively, the way we can solve this problem is by creating a way to resolve paths within a container safely. Because if you look at this example, uh, whoops, if you look at this example, slash CTR is some container file system, right? And containers, I mean, they run within a root file system that is uh, somewhere on the host, there's some slash foobar where that container's file system is stored. And most container runtimes, because it's the obvious way of doing it, right, is, oh, I'll just open the file within the container and it'll be fine. There was a CV that I published earlier this year, which was actually that this exact problem caused uh, you to be able to overwrite ho files on the host. Basically, this, this trivial idea of like, oh, there's a slash CTR, I should just open files underneath it, is a bad one because it doesn't work. You end up being very, very vulnerable to all sorts of bugs. As an aside, this actually isn't just a bug in container runtimes, it's actually a bug in um, many programs. Like, I, I, I would be willing to bet, when I, when I submitted this CV, there were folks who just emailed me and was like, oh, by the way, I found the same bug in tar, I found the same bug in, I don't know, QAMU, I found the same bug in, yada, yada. So, many programs get this wrong right now, including container runtimes, so how do we fix it? So the way we fix it is, is that we fix it in kernel. We create a new kernel API to specify, I want to open this thing. Now, uh, you may not have heard of OpenAT in the first place. OpenAT is an existing syscall that does some magic. I won't get into it. Um, but effectively, we need to add these, these new features to be able to safely resolve paths. So the way it would work is that you have an OpenAT syscall, which takes this open how. The open how takes some arguments. You can ignore the rest of it. It's all just junk. The important parts are um, upgrade mask. Um, I mentioned that, uh, that ProcFS is, is broken, and I'll actually show you a security bug in ProcFS after this. Um, effectively, there is a bug in ProcFS where uh, you can reopen files which you shouldn't be able to reopen, and actually this was the primary reason why one of the security vulnerabilities recently in Docker uh, worked, is because you could actually, the fact that you could overwrite the host binary, uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the reason why that bug worked was because you could reopen a file which was an executable which you shouldn't ever be able to open uh, for writing. But because of this bug, you could open it. Um, so this, this feature lets us fix that as well as fix some other security bugs. And there's this resolve flag, and then the resolve flag takes these arguments, and there's, then there's this one argument that we care about called resolve in root. And this is sort of the main feature that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I've submitted the patch for this um, last week. Effectively, what this will allow us to do is that by using this open at, what we say is we give it the directory file descriptor of the root file system of the container, so slash CTR, then we say I want to open Etsy password or whatever, and then I say resolve it within that root. And then in kernel, that we, I've made a bunch of changes there, to essentially make it so that this path resolution is safe. There are a variety of reasons why this is complicated, um, and the only really safe way or the best way of doing it is in kernel. Um, and Docker actually has code to do this in user space, but it was broken, hence why the security bug happened. So, uh, I, as I said, I submitted the patch um, last week. If you would like to check it out, you can check it out there. Um, I'll, my slides will be on my GitHub uh, later, so you can ask me for it later. Uh, so yeah, so we have this open at, um, new open at thing, uh, which sounds great, right? Problem solved, all good, I can go home now. Well, unfortunately, Nobody uses OpenAT. I mean, I, most container runtimes I've seen don't use OpenAT, except in the cases where you have to use it. Um, and so the fact that we have an OpenAT, by the way, is old. Like, it's, it's at least five or six years old of an interface. So no one's using it at the moment. So how are we going to get people to switch? Also, the interface is actually quite hard to get right because obviously it's a security problem. Uh, just opening a file is not enough. You have to be very, very careful about how you do it. Oh, and also, uh, people still run kernels from five years ago. How do we deal with that problem? So the solution that I've come up with is uh, Screwit will write a library, which is this. You can check it out now, it's on, it's on GitHub. Um, it's a library effectively to make path resolution safe. Uh, and this, once this is done, and once we have the kernel bits done, we can get people to switch to it. Now the main problem, of course, is that now we have to get every single, well, we have to get container runtimes, but we also have to get every single other program that deals with pods, um, which I've been told is, is a couple. There's a couple of programs that deal with files. Uh, on Linux, but um, to get around this problem, we'd have to get them all effectively to switch, or at least the vast majority of them to switch to this library. Um, it's written in Rust, uh, but it has a C API, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and by using this, now, the, sorry, the neat thing I should say is that this library, not only does it have support for this new interface, 
uh, for this new kernel interface. It actually also can emulate it in user space. So you can have on old kernels that don't have this feature, it'll also work seamlessly, um, which is going to solve this problem for old kernels because I know some people are never going to update, um, and that's fine. That's, that's your funeral. Um, okay, so uh, how, what does the interface look like? Um, so what you do is you open, this is in Rust. I'll show you the C1 in a second. The idea is you open a root. You have this handle to the root. You then resolve relative to the root. This result. Excuse me. This resolve is uh, using openat2, the, res the resolution stuff. So it opens it. You have a handle to the file, but that handle isn't actually a file you can use. You then have to reopen it. Now, why do we have to reopen it? Um, again, it's, there's, there's a use case regarding consoles. I don't think I have enough time to get into it. Um, there's a reason for it. If you would like to know, ask me later. Um, but effectively, once you have this file, you can be sure that it is actually that file inside the root file system, and we haven't been tricked. Now, unfortunately, most programs are not written this way. Most programs, they take paths and they pass them around as strings and they open the strings at the end. You can't do that anymore. And so uh, the rewrite won't be simple. We'll have to actually like, restructure quite a lot of programs to get this right. But unfortunately, it's the, it's the only way to solve this problem because you can't, uh, the idea of parsing strings around as paths, which funnily enough is how basically every program does it, uh, is unsafe fundamentally. Like you need to fix it, we need to fix it, um, and it's gonna be a pretty uphill battle. So because it's in Rust, I also have a C API. Looks basically the same. You can do the same thing. Uh, also for fun, you can also use Python because it's in C, so you can use the CFFI stuff. Um, and yeah, so you can now open files and so on and so on. So it's time for a demo, and I'm gonna demo a couple of things. Um, so, all right, let's first start with a demo of the security vulnerability I just mentioned. So as, as you recall, I just said that uh, there is a vulnerability where you can open a file with a mode you shouldn't be able to open it with. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, don't, I haven't set it up to give you the actual exploit example, so I'll just give you a toy example. So I'll create a file. Hello. Oops. Uh, okay. So we have a file called foo. Now what I'll do is I'll tail dash foo, and now this tail program, whoops, this tail program has, This tail program has this file descriptors, has these file descriptors. These are the terminals I was mentioning. If you've ever wondered what those are, that's what they are. You can see they have the number, which is obviously a very good interface. Um, so we have this file that it's opened. And uh, I, I, I encourage you to try this uh, after my talk is over. Open up your laptop and try it on your machine. Because on my machine, when, because I, um, I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually very surprised this demo is working because uh, uh, this kernel I compiled on the train right over here, and I'm very surprised it works. So, uh, yes, awesome. Um, so if I now do, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, now I'm going to try to overwrite this file. So I have FD3, uh, and I want a T, and I get permission denied. Now I encourage you to try this on your own laptops. You'll find that you don't get permission denied, and in fact you can overwrite the file. So this is a security feature that I've added, which effectively what it does, what it boils down to is that uh, What's happened is that this program opened the file for reading. So what I've done is that it remembers that the file's only been open for reading. It's not been open for writing, as you'll see the, the write bit is missing. And then, now I can no longer open that file for writing. Now, what this, what this fixes is it fixes a pretty fundamental problem, which is that if I look at uh, proc self exe, um, oops, uh, okay. So, um, I realized I fixed this as well. Okay, so if you look on your machine, you'll notice that it has the write bit set, um, but it no longer has the write bit set, so it's now no longer possible for me to open it for writing. In addition, and this is, gets a bit more complicated and I can't show you the demo because I'd have to write a bunch of C code to show you, but basically, um, even if you open it, there's a tricky way you can try to reopen it. Like, if you open it for, write, for reading and then you reopen it for reading again and then you open it for writing again, um, even then it won't work, um, which is, uh, it, it took a while to get that to work, so I'm glad that it works. Um, so this fixes that problem, and that, this, this alone fixes a bunch of security problems that we've had, especially security problems where people overwrite host binaries using this technique. So this, this problem is basically solved once the patch is merged. Uh, oh, and also, uh, you can actually even see that, uh, whoops, grep magic, oops, no. Oh, hang on. Okay, well, it's lost, okay, well, there's a, that, that's a bug. Um, I'll fix that later. Um, it basically, it's meant to give you a warning. Hang on, why didn't it give me a warning? There we go, okay, so 
I'm, what, okay, why, why did, I, never mind. Um, basically, the, the, what this gives, it gives you a warning, so it tells you, oh, you tried to open it for writing, but, you can, but it was already only open for reading. So, that works, great. Uh, now to show you the demo of libpathRS, of, of this path resolution library. So, um, where am I? Yep, okay. So we have this, this test, um, so I'll give you, a, a, I'll show you like a basic, like, uh, here's a safe cat. Um, so it, uh, it opens it, it takes a path, opens it, resolves it, opens a read-only, and then reads what's in it. So if I was to, uh, I probably shouldn't cat it because I don't remember what the symlink goes to. So th there's this uh, totally safe uh, symlink here, um, which if I use safe cat and then I do pwd root of s, and then I try to get totally safe here, it says, you're still in the container, screw you. And that's, um, this is using the library. Now, because this machine has the syscall, it's just used openat2, but I can make it use the emulated one. And it's, it also works with the emulated version. And in addition, um, to sort of show that this actually does protect against it, I have this code here, which, uh, long story short, basically it, it tries to exercise the attack that broke Docker. It tries to exercise that attack, a similar one, um, against it using this library. And so if I do rename attack, um, that's fine. So either, you either get like an error or it gets inside container. There's no breakouts. But if I run it with insecurely, you see that it broke outside the container. So effectively, this helps solve these style of problems where you have, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I realized I should have explained what's going on. So, um, basically what's happening is, is that um, the way the doc opens files is that it, it tries to figure out what the safe version of the path is, but as I've told you, you can't have safe, str you can't have string represent a path that's unsafe. And so what happens is there's a race condition, and this is what the security bug from earlier this year did, is that if you swap one of the path components with a symlink over and over and over again, eventually it'll open the wrong file. So that fixes that problem. Now we just get, have to get everyone to switch. I'm sure it'll be very, very easy, um, and I'll be able to get some sleep tonight. So that's the demo. Luckily, that all worked. Um, so it's all done, right? Everything's great. We can all move on. Unfortunately, no. As I said, um, we, need, uh, we need users. We need people to switch to this. Um, it's going to be a bit of an uphill struggle. Um, uh, there was a discussion that I had with some glibc folks about whether or not we could get this feature into glibc. Unfortunately, that turns out to be... Um, it, it's easier to write a separate library and get everyone to switch than it is to get patches into glibc. So um, we're going to instead do it this way. Um, so yeah, we need to do that. And there are also plenty of other problems. Um, for instance, this is work that, um, well, an ex-colleague, but a good friend of mine is working on, uh, which is to try to fix, a, again, a very fundamental problem that's existed for a very long time, which is uh, PID reuse, PID recycling. Uh, processes, when you fork a process on Linux, they all get a PID. Um, but there's a limited number of them, so if you fork a process long enough, eventually you'll get uh, the same PID you got 20 seconds ago. And as a result, there are a bunch of attacks you can do on all sorts of programs, including container runtimes, um, where if you, if you manage to reuse the PID. Uh, so the fix for this is, is this thing called a PIDFD. Basically, you have a file descriptor that ref references the, the process, and then you can do a bunch of cool stuff with it. There's an LWN article if you're interested. Um, and yep, I don't know if, I have any, if I've gone over time, but yes, so that's it. I'm sure it's beer o'clock now, so um, any questions?